Okay, so now that we know a little bit about one of the ways we might study cells, which is by using a microscope, now let's actually talk about cells. When it comes to cells, there are two broad categories of cells. Those are called prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Now, if you recall back to the first chapter, one of the things we learned is that there are three domains of life. Everything on this planet fits into one of those three domains, which is the domains bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. What I said back then is that the domain bacteria and archaea are made out of a type of cell called a prokaryotic cell. And back then I said, for simplicity, I'm going to define it as a cell that does not have a nucleus. The other domain is the domain eukarya. And I said back then, for simplicity, we're going to define it as a cell that does have a nucleus. And I gave you examples of eukaryotes. Those are things like animals, plants, fungus, and protists. So now we're actually going to learn more details about what are the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. But before we talk about the differences, let's talk about the similarities. No matter what type of cell it is, whether it's a eukaryote or a prokaryote, all cells have these same basic features. All cells have a plasma membrane. So what that means is when you think of a cell, um, whether it's a eukaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell, like a bacteria, there has to be something that defines the boundary of the cell, what separates what is the cell from what's not the cell from the environment the cell's in. Okay, that's called the plasma membrane. Okay, so all cells need a plasma membrane. All cells have inside it a fluid-like substance called cytosol or cytoplasm. Now, technically, those two terms are not exactly the same, cytosol and cytoplasm. But for this class, at least for now, we're going to pretend they're the same thing. We're going to use them interchangeably, cytosol and cytoplasm. All cells need to carry genetic information. So they have to have genes, DNA, to carry their genetic information. Now, as we'll learn in much more details in a later chapter, what the DNA is actually coding for is to tell your cells how to build your proteins. For example, as a human, you have about 30,000 genes in your DNA, and that codes for the about 30,000 proteins that humans need. Okay, so what this means is, since all cells have DNA, our genes, all cells need to have a way of building proteins, which is what the genes code for. Therefore, all cells need ribosomes, because ribosomes are the workbenches where you build your proteins. Okay, so no matter what type of cell you are, all cells have these same basic features. Alright, so given that, what's the difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes? So to start with, prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are things like bacteria. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. And in fact, they don't have any membrane-bound organelles inside the cell. Now, I'll define organelles in just a minute when I start talking about eukaryotic cells. Okay, But just for now, let's just focus on the fact that prokaryotes don't have a nucleus or any other organelles. Now, they do have DNA. They have a chromosome. Since they do have DNA, they have a chromosome. That chromosome has to be inside the cell, but it's not inside the nucleus. Instead, it's in a region called the nucleoid. Okay, that's where you find the chromosome inside a bacteria or a prokaryotic cell. And then they have the cytoplasm or cytosol, the fluid inside the cell. They have the plasma membrane, that's what separates the cell from what's not the cell from its environment. They have ribosomes, the little workbenches where you're going to be building your proteins. Okay, now on top of that, bacteria and prokaryotes also have outside of their plasma membrane a cell wall. Okay, so a cell wall is a thick, rigid structure that it acts like a wall. It protects the cell. It protects the cell from the environment it's living in. And that cell does need to be protected because prokaryotes are unicellular. They're only one cell big. In contrast, you, you're a eukaryote, as a human, you're multicellular, you're made out of trillions of cells. Okay, so if you lose a cell, it's really not that big a deal. Like you're losing skin cells every day, okay? But for a bacteria, if it loses one cell, that's that one bacteria, so therefore it loses its life. So it needs to protect itself, that one cell. How it does is it builds a wall around itself. Now, most bacteria also have outside of that cell wall a thick slimy coat, which is called a capsule. Okay, and again, it protects the bacteria for one way by preventing it from becoming dehydrated. 
Now, bacteria also need to be able to move. They don't have legs to walk. So instead, they can move by having these long tails called flagella, and they can spin kind of like propellers and allow the bacteria to swim through the liquid it's living in. So that's the basic structure of a prokaryotic cell, like a bacteria cell. They're unicellular, they don't have a nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles. So in that regards, what do I mean by membrane-bound organelles? Well, eukaryotic cells, like you are built out of eukaryotic cells, so animals, plants, fungus, eukaryotic cells, they do have a nucleus. So our DNA is inside our nucleus. Now what our nucleus is, this would be the nucleus here, is it's a membrane-bound compartment inside the cell. What that means is the cell has a membrane that surrounds it, the plasma membrane. Okay, that's the boundary of the cell which separates the cell from what is not the cell from the environment the cell's in. Then it's kind of like a sphere of a membrane. Then inside that sphere of a membrane, there's another sphere of a membrane, which is the nucleus. The nucleus is where you store all, well, most of your DNA, your chromosomes. So it's a membrane-bound compartment inside the membrane of the cell itself. So the nucleus is one type of organelle. Organelles are membrane-bound compartments inside the cell, okay? And eukaryotic cells have lots of different organelles, things we're going to learn about, like the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, the Golgi, okay? Now, each organelle has a different function it performs. One way I like to kind of think about it to help me to, like, conceptualize it is the organelles are kind of like the organs for the cell like you have organs inside your body what is an organ is a compartment inside your body and each organ performs a different function a different job for example you have a stomach your stomach is a compartment inside your body and the job of your stomach is to start digesting or breaking apart food okay well cells have to eat just like you have to eat Okay, so cells have a compartment inside called a lysosome, and the job of the lysosome is to break down food. Okay, so the lysosome is kind of like the stomach for the cell. Okay, so organelles are kind of like the organs for the cells. And we're going to spend most of the lectures where we're talking about cells to learn about what the different organelles are and their functions. Okay, but in general for now, eukaryotic cells do have membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells do not have membrane-bound organelles. Okay, then obviously they do have cytoplasm, the fluid inside the cell. They have ribosomes to be able to build proteins. And also eukaryotic cells are usually a lot bigger than prokaryotic cells. Okay, that's a, a rough description of eukaryotic cells. And we're going to learn more details about it as we go throughout this series of video lectures. Now recall that all cells have a plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is kind of the boundary, the barrier of the cell, which separates the cell from what's not the cell, the environment around the cell. Now, the plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, which we learned about phospholipids in the macromolecules uh, discussion. Okay, recall what that means is two layers of phospholipids, and those phospholipids, so let's say there's a layer here and a layer here, and those phospholipids have hydrophobic water-hating tails and hydrophilic water-loving heads. Okay, so the center of the membrane is hydrophobic. The periphery of the membrane is going to be hydrophilic. Okay, so that's a quick recap on the phospholipid bilayer, which is the basics of what plasma membranes are. Now, plasma membranes are the barrier, the boundary of the cell. Okay, and the cell has this barrier around it, but things have to be able to get into and out of the cell. Like, for example, the cell needs energy, it needs food, so that has to be able to get into the cell. It also needs oxygen. That has to be able to get into the cell. It has to be able to get rid of waste products like carbon dioxide. So that has to be able to leave the cell. Well, the only way for stuff to get into or out of the cell is by crossing this phospholipid bilayer, the plasma membrane. That's how things get into and out of, and out of the cell. One of the things I told you about cells is they're very small. And it turns out they have to be small. They cannot be big. If a cell gets too big, what happens is the cell dies. Now, the reason cells are small, I'm going to give you kind of the take-home message first and then I'm going to explain it. The reason that cells are small is because they need a large surface area compared to their volume. That's why cells have to be small. They need a large surface area relative or compared to their volume. Alright, so let me explain that a little bit better. 
first, let's picture that this is a cell. So my fist here is a cell. Okay, now my cell here, it has the plasma membrane, like the skin of my fist, okay? And that's how things get into and out of the cell. The only way that something can get into or out of the cell is by passing through this plasma membrane. That's how things get into or out of the cell is by passing through the plasma membrane, the surface of the cell. Okay, so like the, the surface of my fist here. Let's say that we have a cell that's this size, okay? So is that it has a certain size surface area, okay? It's plasma membrane. Let's compare that to a cell that's this size. This cell would have a much bigger surface area, much larger area of its plasma membrane. Okay, so when a cell increases its size, what happens is the size of the plasma membrane increases. Okay, and now, what the plasma membrane determines is how fast things can get into and out of the cell. Okay, because that's how things get into and out of the cells by passing through this plasma membrane. Okay, well, if you have a small plasma membrane, there's relatively small areas for stuff to get into and out of the cell. If you've got a big plasma membrane, there's much more spaces, much more areas for stuff to get into and out of the cell. Okay, so the plasma membrane, the surface area, determines how quickly stuff can get into and out of the cell. Now, back to my cell here, my fist. Okay, my cell also has a volume. That means the three-dimensional space this cell takes up, okay? Now, what volume determines is how quickly the cell can do chemical reactions. Basically, if we have a small cell, it has a relatively small volume. We got a big cell, it's got a much bigger volume. There's a lot more area inside here to fit chemicals. The more chemicals you can fit inside, the faster you can do those chemical reactions. Okay, so surface area determines how quickly stuff can get into and out of the cell, while volume determines how quickly cells can do chemical reactions. And it turns out that cells have to do their chemical reactions very fast. They're doing literally millions every single second. And that's required or else the cell is gonna die. Now, in order to do those chemical reactions, it needs to bring in resources. That's to bring in the basic building blocks. That's to bring in energy. That's to bring in oxygen. How does it do that? By things crossing that plasma membrane, that surface area. Okay, so what I'm building up to is to explain why cells have to be small, because they need a large surface area compared to their volume. For example, let's say that this cube right here this represents a cell and let's say that represents a small cell and picture this cube in your mind in three dimensions okay so that cube is going to have a surface area the area of the surface of like the six sides of that cube that would be the surface area of that cube now compare that small cube that small cell to this big cell okay this big cell obviously has a much larger surface area again picture in your mind in three dimensions the six big sides of this big cube are much bigger than the six small sides of the small cube. So when you increase the size of a cell, you increase its surface area, okay? Now how about volume? Well, this small cell, this small cube, again, picture in three dimensions, has a small volume. The big cube has a much bigger volume, space inside it. So obviously, when you increase the size of a cell, you increase both its surface area and its volume. However, the volume does not increase as fast as the surface area. One way to visualize that is you could imagine one big cell, okay, or imagine a bunch of little cells that are taking up the same volume. All these cells added together have the same volume as this one big cell. However, they don't have the same surface area because this one big cell just has this surface area of the six big sides. Each little cube has a surface area on all six sides, okay? So if you were to take these and expand them out, it would look more like this. The surface area of all of these is much larger than the surface area of this one cell, even though they both have the same volume. This one and all of these added together have the same volume. Okay, so what that means is when you increase the size of a cell, its volume increases much faster than its surface area. Now, any of you who are math inclined, another way to explain it, no worry, if you're not math inclined, it's not hard math. I can guarantee you've all learned this before. 
you've all at one point learned how you calculate area. Like if we have something and we want to calculate an area, it's its length times its width. So let's say its length is measured in meters, width is in meters, so meters times meters. Area is calculated as meters times meters or meters squared. Okay, in contrast, if you want to calculate volume, so let's say we have an object here in three dimensions. Okay, how you calculate its volume is length times width times height, or meters times meters times meters, or meters cubed. So what that means is when you increase the size of something, its area increases by a factor of squaring it, but its volume increases by a factor of cubing it. So therefore, volume increases much more quickly than area. That's not good for a cell because a cell needs to be able to bring in enough resources, have to be able to enter this cell to support its volume. Well, when a cell gets too big, it can't bring enough resources to support that volume and the cell essentially starves to death. Okay, so all of that was me just explaining the take home message. So the take home message is that the reason that cells are small is because they need a large surface area compared to their volume. That's your brief introduction to the basics of cells, basically just defining what's a eukaryotic cell, what's a prokaryotic cell, why are cells small, basic categorization of cells. The next topic we're gonna cover is to learn about the organelles inside eukaryotic cells and what each of them do. So that's what we're gonna cover next.